Here we go. The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to, to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting is recorded and may be viewed on the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40 and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with the roll call of the ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge, present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Cochran? Here. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they do so by to indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered. This is followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and Supreme Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deed to take effect. Tonight's agenda, public hearing, ZBA FY 2022-09. Steve and Deborah Gold request a variance to modify the previously approved variance, ZBA FY 1995-39, in order to remove condition two, which states the, petition, the petitioner shall use the shed slash garage for non-residential use only, pursuant to section 10 of the zoning bylaw, and 40A of the Massachusetts General, By General Laws, located at 272 Amity Street, map 14A, parcel 161, general residence RG and neighborhood residence RN zoning districts. This is continued from January 27th, our January 27th meeting. ZBA FY 2022-10, Ardis Stanini and Shorhe Shafri trustees request a special permit to allow an increase in the number of residential units converted dwelling from one to two under sections 3.324, 9.22, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 47 Valley Lane, map 8A, parcel 77, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. After these, 
We will have general public comment and we'll also have a period where we can consider business not anticipated within the last 48 hours, if any. The first order of business is ZBA FY 2022-09, Steve and Deborah Gold, request a variance to modify the previously approved variance ZBA FY 1995-39 in order to remove condition two, which states the petitioner shall use the shed garage for non-residential use only, pursuant to section 10 of the zoning bylaw and 40A of the Nash Massachusetts general law. Located at 272 Amity Street, map 14A, parcel, 16, parcel 161, General Residence RG and Neighborhood Residential District RN. So are there any disclosures? First, I wanna go through the applicant submissions. These are listed in the project application report, but we've received um, a variance application, a management plan, an approved first and second floor plans made dated March 30th, 1995, existing condition photographs of the structure taken in 2021, email correspondence dated January 25th, 2022 from the applicants to request a hearing continuance. Um, we have plans uh, um, from 272 Amity Street, current and possible future plans dated February 8th. Those are first floor, second floor, current first, second floor possible future plans, north, north and south facades, south facade proposed door, stair material, colors, possible future plans, Westview photos, interior photos and a site plan. Staff submissions include a zoning map of 272 Amity Street, previously approved ZBA FY 1995 variance, comments from the town engineer dated five, January 5th, 2020, project application report, and a, uh, dated January 20th, and the amended project application report or updated project application report uh, dated February 14th, 2022. Um, we have plan waiver requests um, were submitted. Um, our rules re ask, require that a licensed architect or professional engineer um, do building plans, and they have been, um, they're asking that we waive this um provision we had a site visit in um on january 25th during that site visit uh we walked around the existing property the existing garage we observed the distance between the structure and the property line which was the reason for the original variance um, we looked at the um interior downstairs we went upstairs to look at the um the property and the upstairs of the garage um, there was a general discussion with the applicants of their immediate plans for the garage, and there was a discussion, uh, and again, a general discussion for the process of obtaining an accessory dwelling unit if they choose to do so in the future. Um, Craig, you were there. Was there anything, Maureen, you were there. Was there anything else from that um, site visit that would be uh, important to disclose at this point in time? I think we, that's pretty much it. Okay, if there's no additional um, comments on the, the site visit, then um, the applicant can present its, your um, request, and then we'll have questions from the board uh, and from the public if applicable. So um, go ahead, Mr. and Mrs. Um, <laughs> I've forgotten your last name, I'm sorry. Hey, <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Gold. and Mrs. Gold, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, for, first of all, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not, not at all. So um, just wanted to thank everyone, um, Maureen and the board, just for your patience and guidance through this process. Um, we really appreciate it. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, as, as stated in the application, I don't have that part of it right, right in front of me. Um, you know, essentially, um, you know, we wanted to, the opportunity to remove that, um, that restriction and to be able to, to use the property for uh, things that are other than non-residential -res use. Um, we, we expressed, and, and this is our sincere uh, 
plan um, intention is that we we don't have any plans at this time for any construction or to use it as an ADU. Um, we really just wanted to move forward with this first part of the process, and um, and that's also I guess the reason that um, that we we delayed the this hearing because um, we were working with Maureen and a couple of other um, members of the town that that guided me through the or just helped with the process of providing these uh, these these drawings so we, we hope they meet with the board's approval great um, I have one question, Mr. Gold, Mr. or either Stephen or Deborah. Um, when you purchased the property, was it was the upstairs used as it, as you are using it now? Was it used for a, a studio type use or how? Yeah, so we purchased the property for four, three, and a half. three and a half years ago. Um, and uh, yes, they they had a an extended family, and it was in a, we actually and just so you're aware like we we use it for storage essentially um but it was a it's a semi-finished space as the photos show yeah. they used it as storage too they didn't yeah. use it as a dwelling and no. um and as you can see from the photos our daughter stuck a drum kit up there and sometimes goes up there and has played but uh but aside from that like we, there's no good heating or cooling in there right now um, there's a small uh, propane heater that that the tanks on the uh, the side uh, near the tight property line. Um, but yeah, all of that is as is from when we purchased the property three and a half years ago. So we have not painted it, done anything except stick a bunch of stuff up there. So plus a drum kit. <laughs> Maureen. Did uh, Mr. Uh, Deborah and Stephen, did you want to um, show the board the updates to your plan set? Uh, you wanted to, since you're going through the board now, you, you figured uh, to amend your variance, you wanted to capture the, um, ex, you know, the, um, the uh, modification or extension of, of that garage, of that non-conforming structure. So you're including as part of your proposal, uh, staircase and door on the north side of the building, and uh, perhaps a new window on the south facade, if memory serves me, is that it? Yeah, and we might, uh, the north and south might be, be the, yeah, the flipped around. Um, so yes, Maureen, thank you for, for helping us through the, the process. Yes. Um, so yes, we we are interested in that. Um, we do, we are doing this with the understanding that, you know, we will have, you know, formal plans drawn up and obviously construction and building permits and go through that process in the future. Um, but we're hopeful that we can just get sort of this, this general, um, uh, you know, plan approved by the board um, at, at the current time. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, this, this seems like the most logical approach to uh, build out, just to extend the window down to create a door um, in, the, in the rear of the garage, right? Exactly, as shown here. Um, and then to have an exterior platform uh, you know, all, obviously everything conforming to code uh, at the time that we, we move forward with this, um, which we have, again, no current plans to do, which is why we were trying to avoid the expense of hiring an architect and, and doing these drawings and things by ourselves. Um, but yeah, essentially that would be the only change to the exterior footprint. The, and then on the positive side too, um, you can see, so on the left-hand photo, to the right where the white garage door is. If you go to the right of the right-hand window, there's a fence there, uh, a brown, light, exactly. That's where the propane tank is located. And as part of any future plan, and maybe even sooner, 
we would actually be removing that tank and probably that fence and putting in a, a like a split mini split mini split type unit. So, in essence, you know, we we would actually be you know freeing up um, space on on the side of the the structure where the property line is tight, and um, yeah, and then and then the only other change so that would that would subtract from the footprint or or at least from the sort of functional um, space being used. Um, on the property and and clear more room uh, near the property line, and then exactly at the opposite side, the back side of the building um, is where we would build the, the platform and, and the stairway. And again, those are those are just our our ideas that we're hoping to to be considered for now. And um, of course, in the future, if if an architect or the town recommended something different. Um, you know, we, we would certainly be open to that. Um, Mr. Mr. Mrs. Gold, um, you under, you are not claiming that this is um, a residential property right now. It's not uh, habitable as a dwelling, as a separate dwelling. You're not asking for it to be approved right. as a accessory right. dwelling or an ADU or anything else. So you're not looking to change um, you're not seeking that. And you know that if you were to do that, that requires additional, first of all, you'd have to meet all the requirements of an ADU and you'd need to do substantial work to that structure in order to make it uh, habitable. And, and you'd have to get a rental permit, which yeah. you're not asking for as well. That, okay. that's, correct. Correct. that's correct. We confirm that. And so what I, I tend not to want to put issues before the board that aren't current that you know that are just kind of down the road somehow we might want to do this but in this case you have in this case i'm i don't think that's what you're doing here i did before but in looking at this closer i think what you're doing is saying that we have a use of that of that uh, area that is related to residential use it is it's not a residence it's not a dwelling unit but it's connected to the house and in order to continue to use it the way you have been using it, and perhaps people beforehand, that that condition in that waiver needs to be removed. Otherwise, you are in violation of the waiver. I think you're in violation of the variance at that point. So, if, and that's how I look at this. And I'm going to ask Rob if that is a correct way to look at this, or if I have missed something in the um, in the the definition of a residential use and what the what was meant by that condition and the variance. So, Rob, could you either in, enlighten me or um, wh whatever whatever is appropriate? Tell me what's appropriate in this situation. No, I, I think you captured it really well. I, I think that's exactly the situation as we understand it, and uh, you know, see this as a good improvement to the property, and we'll work with the owners to you know get the right permits and the certificate of occupancies in place to to catch up with what had happened there under a prior ownership and hopefully even see some improvements. So, you know, it'll give us the opportunity to look for smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and make sure the building is fitted properly for that use that you just described that isn't quite a full dwelling unit yet. Sure, and yeah, and I, I think that, um, yeah, we're, we're pleased to go through that process. I, I believe that, you know, well, I don't know what the codes are precisely, but it, you know, it seemed, I'm not sure how the former owners got the, the upstairs to the point where it is. I mean, it was clearly built out. It was out. two owners ago. Okay, but, but you know, it was sort of sold to us as part of the residential space and they had used it, you know, I guess as, an, as a recreation area. Um, I think they had a ping pong table or something up there for their grandkids, things like that. Um, so yeah, anything that we can do, um, again, we're not interested in ATU at this time. Um, we just want to sort of bring it into conformity and be able to sit there and, you know, maybe use it as sort of a little separate off, you know, place where we can sit and just do some work for, for an hour or something. Again, it's not a comfortable space right now, and there's no plans to do any major updates, but it'd be great if we could bring it into conformity. Mr. Meadows? I just wanted to go farther on that same theme. I just wanted to understand that um, 
a non an office is a non-residential use. A play area or whatever is a is a non-residential use. But those non-residential uses need to have um, smoke detectors, uh, egress, etc., that are required. Is that and that that is the purpose of this request. Mr. Mora, I see your hand up. So, you know, I see this as residential use. So it's really an extension of the single family dwelling. It's additional space, bonus room, playroom, whatever, you know, you want to call it. Um, so it is really residential space. And the question is, is it habitable space? And we do define that in our various codes and in, 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 our, in our bylaw so that it can be used for that residential purpose. That doesn't make it its own standalone dwelling unit. Its own, its own dwelling unit by definition that needs to have a bathroom, a full kitchen, uh, a private bath, uh, bedroom for, or sleeping quarters. It doesn't have all of that. So it's still a residential space, no different than a basement being finished or a bonus room you know, in the house being finished. It needs to meet minimum standards for use, being used in that way. So as such, can it simply be the building commissioner can go come in and, and the fire uh, department can come in and say, these are the things that you need without us making a judgment. In other words, do we really need to make a judgment on this? Or can you just do it as, you know, as the, pre, pe, the, the departments that need to make these requirements now that you know that those requirements need to be put in place? I, I don't understand why we need, need to make a judgment on this. Mr. It, seems, it, it seems to me that that they are in if if the um, space has a residential use, even though it's tenuous to the to the building and it is residential, as opposed to commercial or some other. If it has residential use, then they are in violation of the of the variance because that structure from that 1995 variance said that they had to have non only non resident residential use in the uh, in the variant as a condition of the variant. So they would have to not use it even as they've been and other owners have previously been using that space, not as a dwelling unit, but as an as a extension of their own house. So I don't think that I don't think the building commissioner can on his own change the conditions of that variance. The variance is the variance is what makes what they're what they they have, what other people have done prior to them. Um, incompatible with the with uh, the specifics of the variance, so I think that's the answer to your question. Okay, and and as such, do we need do abutters need to be contacted for this? They yeah. have been. They were. And yes. So there are no comments. Correct. Yes. No, so, yes. Oh, okay. sorry. Uh, just like every other public hearing, there's a legal ad that's placed in the Daily Hampshire Gazette twice, leading up to the meet tonight's. Uh, to the public hearing. And then uh, abutters uh, within 300 feet of this property are notified of this public hearing by regular mail. And um, I haven't received any comments from neighbors or from anyone um, in general about this application. Yeah, and, ju and just to share- And I failed, and I, Mr. Meadows, I did fail to note that in the introduction to this beginning that there is no comments, public comments. Okay. Thank you. There and, might and, be, there might be yet, but there hasn't been any submitted. Yeah, it just, it, it, we can add just a little bit of color to that. So we've spoken with our neighbors about it and there's no issues at all. I mean, the, the property on the side um, where the property line is a little close to the property line, that's a, a three unit um, residence um, that they have there. Uh, and so, that has been an issue and one other uh, neighbor called us after receiving the notice just to ask us what our intentions were. So there, we explained exactly as we've explained to you. Are there any other questions from board members? If not, um, Maureen, do we have anybody from the public um, who wishes to Let's see, I'll look at this and see if the any of the attendees or any of the public um, raising not, their hand. I don't see anybody. 
No, I don't see anyone. All right. Um, if unless there's questions from other board members for the applicants or comments, I would entertain a motion to open the public meeting on this matter while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather additional information. Do I have such a motion? Oh. And, and that looks like there were two, so I have a first and a second. Uh, any discussion on the motion? If not, this requires a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Cochran? Aye. Motion carries, it's unanimous. We are on public meeting now to discuss the application to amend the variance on this property. So I would suggest that the way we should go about this is we look at the three conditions contained in the application report, um, discuss those, see if we have any additional conditions, and then we can make our findings based on you know, assuming that those conditions, whatever we decide, those conditions are would be applied to the application. But before we begin, I want to, um, on this, I do wanna comment on what Mr. Meadows said, and I wanna share his feelings that I really don't wanna be, I don't, as a rule, like to be making, um, taking up everybody's time and, and take, considering applications that aren't really gonna be um, acted on or aren't necessary for us to act on. Everybody's busy enough without having to do that. This is a case I think where they would be deprived of their, what is reasonable to be thought would be their use of the property um, if we didn't act because of the, uh, the, the wording of the prior variance. So I think you and I share the same concerns, Mr. Meadows, and. Uh, we'll work hard not to have us have to take up actions that don't make a lot of sense and don't make a big difference. Um, the project application report has three conditions. The first is the standard condition that um, it's got to be it's got to be built and maintained according to the drawings submitted by the applicants, um, and that any um, anything. They, they have to be reviewed by the building commissioner to determine if the, if the submission is net to the boarding of appeals board of zoning of zoning board of appeals is necessary and changes may be reviewed and or approved by the ZBA at a public meeting or changes are significant enough to require a formal modification of the permit. So what that just generally means is what you submitted, is, if you do what you submitted, you're not gonna have to come back before us. If you change your mind, you're gonna have to come back before us. And what you have to do is do what you get, what you submitted. All right, that's pretty standard. Um, second, all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass on to adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be selected according to the dark sky compliance recommendation of the ZBA rules and regulations. So we'd like you to put the existing lights as dark sky compliant lights. And when you do give the cut sheet or the, um, the um, to, if you buy, if this is a condition, you have to give it the cut sheet or a description of that to the building commissioner so they can approve it. That it indeed does comply with dark sky compliant. Yes, Maureen. I, I believe the goals actually uh, included a um, a stock photo of of what the lighting would be for the door on the south facade, and then the photo show of of light on the north facade. So and um it, and it appears to be all dark dark sky compli compliant. Well, there'll be cut sheets with it so you know the staff can check make, make sure i'm not familiar with it so just make sure that it is you don't have any problem with that condition okay and lastly um any dwelling unit on the property being rented shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the residential property bylaw that's almost um it has to be anyway but if you're not having a rental property at this point um does anybody have comments on any of those conditions? Okay, then the, um, I'd like to, what we need to do is um, consider whether to remove the second um, condition on the previous variance and re remove that from the variance. Um, we don't, need to make any additional findings that I'm looking at. Um, I think we can just move to, we can consider just whether to remove that 
that condition and amend the, amend the variance by removing that condition. Um, is, so is there any discussion regarding that from members of the board or from staff? If not, I would entertain a motion that we remove the cond condition two on the variance uh, issued in 1995 uh, with the three conditions listed in the project application report. Is there, um, I would entertain that motion. Is there such a motion? Mr. Max, Mr. Maxfield, is there uh, a second? Yeah, so moved. Oh. No, so, so moved, yeah. Yep, yep. Is there a second? Second. Any dis discussion on the motion? If not, this requires a roll call, uh, four votes. I vote aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Cochran? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. All right, congratulations. Good luck. Much. Yeah, th thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. We really appreciate everybody's help. Yeah, and your time. Good. Much appreciated. All right. Good luck. Good luck right, to morning, you. Morning, we'll be in touch. So we'll thank be you. in touch, yep. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Rob. All right. The next order of business is FY 202210. Um, Ardis Stanini and Shorhei Shafi, trustees, requesting a special permit to allow an increase in the number of residential units, converted dwellings from one to two under sections 3.324, 9.22, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 47 Valley Lane, map 8A, parcel 77, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. Are there any um, disclosures? If there are no disclosures, uh, let's run through the submissions and I will find them here in a second. Here we go. The applicant submissions are a uh, special permit application, a management plan, additional app re information required for apartments, a complaint response plan, property map, parking map uh, for four spaces, building plans prepared by DWS of New England, home design. Um, there are four of those. There's existing lighting photographs, a lease agreement, email correspondence from the Hadley Planning Board dated October 21st, 2021. There are also waiver requests for a site plan, a request the site plan not to be prepared by a registered engineer, surveyor, landscape architect, section 3.113 of ZBA rules, a sign plan and a waiver for requested for a landscape plan. Staff submissions are a project application report. Uh, there are no public uh, comments either. Maureen, there's been none since this was prepared, is there? I have not okay. received any. We conducted a site visit on February 17th. Uh, we walked the property, identified the area of the lot, which is in Hadley. There's a small part of this lot in Hadley. Um, and we looked at the parking area, uh, the one close to the house and the area where cars were parked uh, while we were there. We toured the interior, both the first and the second floors. Um, we observed how at present they are, it's one, uh, it's, there's no, uh, definition between the two, what will be two units. It's just one, uh, it's an open space now. Uh, you can go from the upstairs, which will be the upstairs unit to the downstairs unit with, um, without going through doors. We observed how uh, we looked at where the construction would take place of firewalls to, in the entryway. We looked at, and also that there's firewalls will be for the ceilings to create two separate dwelling units we asked if there was going to. We asked if it was going to continue to be owner occupied, and the response was that it would be occupied by a member of the family trust. Um, and I think that pretty much sums up what we. We also observed that the land is close to uh, UMass property. It looks to be a um, a field. I don't know if it was a, a next to a a field, and I don't think it was a cultivated field. I think it was wildlife, and there looks to be a some conservation land a little farther off that the, that the property abuts. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for our site visit. Um, 
Ms. Parks, do you have anything else you want to add in terms of the site visit or the questions asked? Great. Um, so at, at this point in time, who is going to who represents the applicant and wishes to speak? Please identify yourself for the record. We can see you, Mr. Go. Rice. Sorry, there you are. Uh, right. My name is Christopher Rice. Uh, I live at 351 Federal Street in Montague, Massachusetts. Uh, the Shapis have asked me uh, to present this. Um, English is a second language for them and they have trouble communicating sometimes. Um, so uh, they asked me to help them out and here I am. Um, we've, uh, I assume, oh, first of all, I do wanna thank Maureen as well for all the input and the help as well as all the other staff at the uh, building commissioner's office um, for getting all these ducks in a row on this. Um, basically, the Shappies uh, purchased this property uh, in 2020. Uh, it was a six bedroom property. Um, it uh, is designated as a single family unit. Uh, they purchased it to keep their son and grandson in. And it turns out that they would like to have it separate so that they can have um, some privacy for the young child um not you know in the same household so to speak as 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 the other units um they uh, plan no uh major changes at this time other than the um uh prescribed changes that will be necessary to meet or exceed all the building codes which would be separate egress um entrance uh fire suppression and um uh, fireproofing and also um, there'll have to be some changes made for access to the um, emergency egress windows of the bedrooms in the basement. Um, we've asked for, um, as you stated, some um, um, you know, the, the, not having a professional architect, uh, I mean, um, landscape architect to do the exterior because there's really no changes. Um, the pictures of the property, it's actually a, a very attractive property. Um, nice lawn and trees, uh, the lighting all appears to be compliant. Um, at the time of the work, we'll um, get the needed cut sheets on all the lights and find out uh, if they are indeed dark uh, skies compliant. Um, find out what they are and if they, um, the Shappies agree that, you know, if they aren't, they'd be glad to um, to put in the proper lighting. I hope that the um, the board has had a chance to take a look at the submissions. I assume they have. Uh, we tried to be as complete as possible with our submissions, and of course, Maureen went and uh, was very helpful in that. Uh, I Christopher, did you want to? Um, would you like to sort of walk them through the floor plan? I just zoomed into the upper floor, so. So that's unit one, I guess. Did you want yeah, we'll to explain the different um, rooms and the and yes. the immediate e e egress? Yeah, it's it's just basically a, a you know a race ranch um, type type of building, and uh, you know the front door goes up into a split set of stairs. Um, there's a side entry door um, that comes up and enters into the kitchen. There's a deck that was put on that goes into a door that enters into the living area. Um, so you know, in order to make, the, make this unit more separate, um, you know, the, the wall, as I think it showed in a dotted line, um, would have to be built. That's existing, but that's the area um, where we'd want to block off. And that still leaves um, two areas of egress and that, They've gone back and forth, but I think they're actually going to have a door, uh, uh, a rated door at the top of the stairs too. So that'll actually give them three uh, means of egress for the upper unit. Um, and then it looks like you have three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Correct. Correct. Uh, three, again, all all existing the way, the way it was. Uh, three bedrooms, uh, a living area, two bathrooms. 
and a uh, a dinette in a kitchen. Okay. Let's look at the um, existing conditions of the lower level. Okay, so the existing conditions have have three bedrooms, bedroom room number one, two, and three. Um, currently the windows, the way that it was purchased, uh, the windows um, are not accessible as an emergency egress because they're too tall um, to meet the minimum standards of the building code. So we're gonna make some alterations uh, to make those easily accessible for emergency uh, egress and escape. Um, Sorry. So um, so that was existing. Do we? Um, I can show the proposed. Yeah, let's go I'm to sorry. proposed, Maureen. Yep, let's go to the proposed. That'd be helpful. So, and again, it, everything that's there is there. You know, there's no construction of any of anything at this point. There's a mechanical room, washer dryer. Uh, there's a bathroom, uh, bedroom one, bedroom two, bedroom three, and a family room. Um, they have a uh, uh, an egress door up a few stairs out to the back of the structure. And um, then the other is through the, um, through the half, half a flight of stairs and up through the front door. Um, so all these areas would have to be, um, uh, would have to be, would have to meet uh, fire separation codes, um, which would be an, an additional permit will have to be modified or another building permit um, from the building commissioner's office um, to meet or exceed all, all of the building codes on this part. I think that's it on the plans. I had one quick question. Where in the plans does it indicate that you're, that you're replacing the, the emergency egress windows for the, bit, the lower unit? Well, because we can't re we can't replace them because they'd be underground. So I've talked to the building and uh, commissioner's department, and um, we're going to make some platforms on the inside to make them compliant. They're large enough. They're egress windows, but they have to be. Um, I believe the number is forty three or forty five inches off the ground to make them easily to get easy to get to, and they're currently not. So by building a platform on the inside um, by the windows. So um, we spoke with, uh, I believe it was uh, Mr. Wiskevitz, um or it was John Thompson, I don't remember, um, who said that um, that would be acceptable. So all that would need to be done prior to the uh, build, uh, uh, residency or occupancy permit being given to the Rob would that have to be done by, and you, and you guys have to approve it before they get an occupancy That's right, or... they, would, they would amend the building permit if they have one already or, or, or apply for another building permit to formally create the, the second unit and all this work that would be associated with it. So that, that particular issue and others that Mr. Rice had mentioned would be worked out with the building inspector during construction. And do, would that, be done without a need for a condition from us or do we need to condition that so that it happens? Is that, a, is that part of the building code or do we have to condition it? These are all building code items. So you, okay. you, don't, you don't necessarily have to condition specific Got building it. code. Of that. Not that one. Okay, good. Mr. Rice, go ahead. Uh, so I think um, that explains you know, there's a small kitchenette downstairs and a bath. Um, oh boy, what's doing here? Um, we show our parking. There was the original. Well, actually, all of these parking spaces have been here. Uh, excuse me. Um, well, since since the first time I looked at it, which was only about four months ago, so I'm they I'm assuming they've been like this for the last couple of years. Um, you know, there was really no no change of, of parking. They have plenty of parking there. Uh, are those on, um, Mr. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but are those <laughs> five, six, seven, and eight on uh, improved surfaces? I know one through four next to the house are either it's gravel or it's, I forget if it's gravel. Marine, you may have pictures. It's either gravel or tar. What about- Yeah, uh, I, think, I think it's TRG. 
It's gravel and TRG. Okay. Which is I just didn't recall. Is, yeah, which will allow the water to penetrate through it. We don't like to really, although there's it's not a major issue over there, but um, you know it's water permeable. Okay. Um, there we go. So we got asphalt and then, yep. Yeah, right. and that, yeah, so you can see the this red line um, shows sort of the extent of the, the um, gravel parking area. And then um, there's four spaces um, to the west of the, the of the house. So on the side side of the home of the house, there's four spaces. And it looks like, you know, easily four spaces could be provided here. So it would be a total of eight spaces. And I believe there is going to be a total, a maximum of seven tenants that will reside at this property. So, so, um, so all seven residents would have a parking space and there would be uh, an extra, uh, a dedicated spot for like a visitor or someone, you know, dropping off a delivery or something. But if it's be two units, it exceeds the minimum requirement of two spaces per unit. Yep, which is okay. which is allowed under the bylaw. Yep. Yep. I don't know if you want to see the yeah uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, do you want to, Mr. Rice? Do you want to address the one issue that uh, is here, which is that. Um, this proposal doesn't meet the dimensional regulations normally required under um, that is required under the bylaw um, to have two unit two dwelling a converted unit a converted dwelling you know you have to add an additional six thousand square feet to the lot bring uh, that means you'd need twenty six thousand square feet for the lot there's only twenty two thousand um, can you can you address that issue well I think um that um, the, the way that it's situated in the neighborhood with the open fields and the fact that they have the extra Hadley land there, um, I don't think the Hadley land is figured in that square footage, although I'm not 100% sure of that. Uh, and I apologize for not knowing that at this time. But we don't think that it, it will have an effect on the neighborhood. Um, I, I'm not totally familiar with all your, your, the level of your zoning laws. Um, they're extremely, um, they're pretty complex. You have very, you know, most towns have four or five zonings. Um, you've taken the time to, to be a lot more concise on yours, but we don't think that this will uh, take away from the neighborhood in any way. Um, we haven't, you know, we haven't heard from anyone, uh, so. We would ask the board to consider this. All right. Just to clarify, uh, board may, you know, allow that, um, you know, the, 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 you know, technically the, the, they have two dwellings in the, I believe this is the RN. Yeah, the uh, neighborhood residence zoning district. Uh, you would need, um, stay with me for one second. You would need 20,000 square feet for the, as, to serve as the basic minimum lot area for one dwelling, and then uh, 6,000 square feet additionally uh, for a second unit. So that would equal 26,000 square feet. On the property total, which is uh, including a small amount in Hadley, and, uh, in, and then in Amherst equals about 22,500 square feet. But under the converted dwelling section under standard eight, there's a provision that could uh, uh, allows the discretion for the board to allow um, a one-time only uh, exemption from from that dimensional regulation. I think the um, go ahead, Mr. Rice. Oh, um, the fact that it's on on obviously that it's on water and sewer. And so the, the lot size isn't, isn't as much impacted if, if it were in a, you know, more country setting with a septic tank and a well. Well, also the structure won't look any different. It won't 
really act any different. It's actually going to have less people. It was used to, you know, I think for totally for student houses, and now it has two people living downstairs, um, for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, and then, you know, the, the folks upstairs. So, um, and, you know, with a resident in there, we're hoping for it to be very low impact on the neighborhood. Um, the, the shoppies are very serious about, you know, taking good care of their property. As you can see, it's a nice looking property. And I don't think it will be detrimental to the neighborhood. Yeah. Anyway. Um, um, and Thanks. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to point out, um, so in case um, there's any kind of confusion, uh, the property that's um, outlined in yellow is within the town of Amherst. And then if you see this um, dotted line that's um, dotted in black with a gray highlight along here, that's the town line. So over on the left of that dotted line is the town of Hadley, but the property itself um, goes into Hadley. And then it, it, if you follow my cursor here, it shows the, the outline of the property. I just wanted to clarify that. Yep, thank you. And it, as noted, Hadley has said they have no interest in this proceedings. It, yeah, it's correct. A, a, a comment. I did have one other question and then we, um, if then we can open up to questions from others. Um, the, our bylaws have various um, can, uh, requirements depending on whether you are a owner occupied converted dwelling or not. And I know currently that property is um, owned and a resident is a member of the family trust that owns that. Um, is, does the family intend to, con I guess the, the family intend to continue that number one. And if, are they aware that if they have somebody outside that family trust who is not an owner occupant, it changes some of the uh, requirements for the uh, property um, it, for the it, dwelling. Um, it's my assumption that uh, they do plan on continuing this the way that it is. And uh, if Shore was not um, aware that of the changes that could happen if, if they move out, I'm assuming since she's listening to us, she's aware of that mm -hmm. now. Um, okay. it, so I don't, it, it, uh, Shore, if you if, if you're not aware of any of this and you'd like to speak up, please feel free. Um, we're not in the same room. I'm in Arizona in the mountains and she's in Amherst. So uh, uh, Shora, hey, do you have anything to say on this? If so, you need to unmute yourself. Shora. Um, no, my son and my grandson are gonna leave there. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Mora. Does this is a new a new situation for me? A family we have a trust that owns this. It's a family trust. Is that considered? How do you become an owner? What's considered an owner occupant of a property that's owned by a family trust? Is it anybody who's a, a beneficiary of the trust, or is it a member of the family? How do we determine that? Or is this new? Is this kind of what? You know it when you see it. Yeah, it really is something that we have to look at case by case. And we would typically ask for the trust documents, probably have a couple of questions for their attorney and make the determination. In, in many cases, it's found that they're not actually owner occupied. Uh, so, you know, that, that's why I would suggest that if, if the board were to grant this permit that they uh, you know, use the language that's in, in condition six of the bylaw that says that it shall either be owner occupied or mm -hmm. there be a resident manager. And then we can, uh, you know, we can sort that out during the permitting, the rental permitting stage and understand that better. Uh, and we have, uh, we have people in our office that are, are used to looking for those documents and, and, and working through that question. And we haven't, we haven't looked at this particular trust to know one way or the other yet. Okay. All right. Um, and lastly, Mr. Rice, when do the um, when do you think this work will be completed? Many times when we do special permits that involve construction, we say it should be done in you know 
in a year or or 18 months how um, we we how clearly want this done as soon as possible um, the contractor you know it is ready the materials have been bought whatever had to be bought so I would think uh, although the shortage of materials on some things yeah. has been really an issue but um, I, I think that we'd be comfortable with six months or a year, whatever the board's comfortable with, we're fine. All right. We clearly plan on getting this done. Well, let's, let's look to six months uh, as a condition for completion, makes sense. And if you have, I mean, and then again, if you have trouble with, with uh, building materials, you just, you can come to the building commissioner and, and take care of that. If need be, you can come to us again, but I doubt that needs to be done. All right. So let's have that added to the condition, Maureen. You would like the work to start or to finish within six months? Well, I, let's have it start within six months and be completed in a year. That gives them time to, there is some shortage. I mean, they have every incentive to do this sooner, sooner rather than later. So I'm not worried that they're going to delay on it, I don't think, but once they get the materials. Um, are there any other questions from board members? I've asked many. I, I want to make sure I give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. Okay. Um, is there any public comment? We see, I see one hand up. Uh, Michelle Bor Bor Borkius, can you please me, identify yourself please. and your um, and give your yes, address? Hello, hello, hi. Hi, this hi is there. Michelle. Can you say your name and your address? Yes, my name is Michelle Borkius, and I'm a resident uh, homeowner at 23 Valley Lane. Yes, um, please keep your um, comments to about three minutes, but we'd love to hear your, your comments. Okay, um, this neighborhood is a neighborhood of single family homes. Um, that is a mix of homeowners and rentals at this point. Um, we recognize our proximity to UMass campus makes it um, a, a place where people want to live. Um, this, our street is a, is a dead end street. So to get to this house, all of the traffic has to pass um, people going in and out. Um, so I think that I'm one of many in the neighborhood concerned with this house being split to a, a two, two um, apartment residence. Um, it increases the number of people that will be regularly driving past our house and um, I think, um, you know, when the, the house first started having work done on it, there was a, a lot of people questioning if, if it was being turned into a dual occupancy house. And the, um, the people who had purchased it um, were, people in the neighborhood had been asking John Thompson to tell us more about what was going on. What did he hear? Was it being turned into a rental? Um, and he wasn't getting a lot of information or able to communicate very much in, information wise, but ultimately found out that it was um, turning into an owner occupied uh, rental. So I think um, my personal largest concern is that this house gets split into a, a two apartment house and then it gets resold or the people who say they're gonna be living there aren't actually the ones that are living there. And it's a, you know, hopefully only four person per unit um, uh, residence, which would make eight people living in this house. Um, so I, I think I'm happy to, I, I've never come to a board hearing. I don't know how this process works. Um, we were encouraged by John Thompson and other people um, in our neighborhood to, to speak out and to share that we have concerns about this. Um, this house has been used as a student rental over the years. It's had a really bad history. Um, the current owners, ha we haven't had any issues in the last year. I would love to say that they're doing a great job, but that doesn't mean that that's what's gonna continue moving forward. 
And I also recognize they own the house and they get to use it. <laughs> um, so my, my concerns are just out of the changing dynamic and that if this is a residential neighborhood that it remains residential and not an apartment neighborhood. Thank you very much. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Rice, do you wish to respond to the public comment? Um, please, I, please, and please direct your comments to the board, not obviously not to the uh, to Ms. Bork. Yes, uh, I understand uh, Michelle's comments, and I think uh, you know, and I, uh, the fact that the Chappes have done a great job of keeping taking care of the house. Um, I think with you know, there's there's two people living living downstairs. I think it's probably going to be a lot quieter having a, you know, a young kid in the house than it might have been in the past. Um, you know, the when you're there with your young child, I think your tolerance for noise will be a lot lower than it would be if it were just the way it was a, um, you know, a, a six bedroom house. Um, so, and of course, uh, you know, we definitely um, would be you know, that's part of the complaint process, I believe. And the, and the manager, um, you know, the on-site manager, which looks like we'd probably be heading that way, um, you know, the, to respond and uh, be responsive um, to these issues and to be a good neighbor. Any other members or comments from members of the board? I guess the one comment I would make is um, the, and Mr. Rice, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If I look at the lease um, agreement, the lease agreement limits the number of people who shall be, who shall be there at any time. The lease says that there should be no gatherings or events held at the premise. Um, there are um, no more than four people present in the house in addition to the named tenants. So the lease itself um, has a limit on um, not only gatherings, but the total number of guests. Um, and, and I do, so that is one thing that I think can um, respond to some of the concerns that Michelle had is that the, the, the at least the current lease that the owners have would, would limit the uh, party or the gatherings, which could be of concern. Um, also, I don't know if there's a history, a complaint. We didn't, I didn't see a complaint history on this property. Um, uh, and, but, and I don't, and, and the question is also whether it was complaint history of current owners or complaint history with previous owners. Maybe you guys can find that out if there's anything recently, but um, we didn't, I didn't see anything in the, the project application report. It, um, it looks like, uh, according to our records on GIS, the last complaint was um, filed in uh, January 7th, uh, 2019, uh, about loose trash blowing in the neighborhood and cars parking on the lawn. Question about over occupancy since there are often too many vehicles parked on site. Re registered vehicle has changed hands, no owner owner's contact information. And then that was closed out um, at the end of that month. And then there was one other complaint in, in May of 2018 regarding collection of garbage and trash. Mr. Rice, when did the, when, did the, when was this per, uh, property purchased by the Shafis? 2020. All right, any further questions, comments, or things? If not, um, I would entertain a motion that we move to um, move to a public meeting on this matter and we keep the public hearing open in case we need to get additional information from the applicant or from staff. Do I, is, is there such a motion? So moved. Is second. there a second? Uh, this, is there any discussion? If not, um, this requires a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. 
Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Cochran? Aye. All right, we're in the, we're in the uh, public meeting phase. That's where we de deliberate um, and we uh, can talk about the, um, generally, I'd like to first just generally talk about hearing from the board, uh, how you feel about this application. And then I'd like to go through the conditions listed, um, see if we agree with the ones on the project application report, if there's any we wish to add. And then because that informs the findings we have to make, we can go and make the findings we have to make under the converted dwelling and the 10.38 uh, uh, to, to approve the special permit applications. So I'd like to hear what people think generally about the application for a special permit and to create a converted dwelling. Uh, all right, if there's not strong, not strong feelings on that, let's go through conditions uh, uh, on the, uh, on the property, on the special permit. Um, if you'll turn to the um, project application report, um, page 11 of 13, um, the conditions listed by in the, the draft um, or the, the project application report includes number one, the standard project shall be built, maintained according to the approved plans. Um, special permit application, they are listed. Um, the second condition is the converted dwelling shall be used as labeled in the following approved floor plans. Those are the ones that are submitted um, that we've viewed and they're in our packet. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass. This is one that I, the, if you have any comments about any of these conditions, please raise your hand and let me know. But this is one that I feel strongly about, um, not only for light trespass on the pro existing properties, but we have a lot of wildlife and and you have, um, I think, some conservation land nearby. And so there's wildlife around. And I think it's important that we have light uh, downcast and dark sky compliant light. It says no more than four, the fourth one is no more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy the converted dwelling. And I think the converted dwelling is the basement. The upstairs is the um, existing portion right now. There's there's uh, the sun or, there's a, a, one adult and a child living in the basement. That's correct. And that's this said that there should be no more than four unrelated adults would be a total. Uh, so that could be a total of, of eight in the building. Maureen. Uh, could uh, Chris or the homeowner clarify how many um, tenants um, will be residing in the lower level and in, in the lower unit and the upper unit? Um, in the additional information in the under the management plan, I, I'm noticing that it says if you turn to, I have to find it. Hold on one second. Yep. Um, yeah. We, you, we, turn, we oh, put if down you turn the, to page uh, three of thirteen, um, sort of at, at towards the end, end of the page, it says additional information required for apartments. Bullet two, the second bullet says. Previously, there were six tenants that resided in the house. The applicant proposes to have a maximum of five tenants residing on the property. Correct, and two of them will be related. Okay, and so what, what unit will the two reside Downstairs. in? Downstairs. Okay, so two tenants in uh, the lower unit and, and, that, and then how many upstairs? About three upstairs. So that's a total of five on the property. Correct. Did, does the board want to modify condition four to reflect that or? Mr. Rice, you're locking that in um, for the, the property. Let me, let me communicate with the owner for one second. But typically uh, you have four units, you have four individuals, unrelated individuals per unit, maximum of eight. But if you're will, if the property owners are willing to limit it to less. The board, well, we don't, I, 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 I was under the impression that they were taking the entire structure and not that we had to add up to five. So if we could, you know, it, it seems like, you know, we could go with, you know, whatever it seems, you know, the three and three. 
Because there's I mean, three bedrooms in the lower level and then three bedrooms in yeah, the upper level. Bedroom on top. Correct. Yep. Ms. Parks? I thought there were four people on the upper level. Yeah. Okay. I think there's four people there now. There were three bedrooms and they, I think one bedroom was shared. Downstairs, there were three bedrooms and it looked like there was one person and maybe a, a, a child living downstairs. So it's, I think, I think that there is at least six people in that. And I think this number four was talking about the downstairs, which is the converted dwelling, which would be um, a question of whether they, whether they have there's, two or four. There's four up and two down. I apologize. Okay, four up and two down. So you, you're saying you wanna limit the number four to two unrelated individuals no more than two unrelated individuals shall occupy the converted dwelling. That's downstairs. Um, I'd rather stay with whatever is allowed through the um, um, through the town. Through the, okay, the town bylaws That's, uh, zoning, please. And I apologize is there any, for being unclear. Is, is there any thoughts by board members on that? That's the common, typical, and routine limitation is four per dwelling unit. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, street number. Yes, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, I was going to say. I mean, do we do we think it would would help alleviate any uh, resident concerns or neighborhood concerns if we were to put a limit on that? Because uh, I know looking at that parking, I imagine if you were to have eight people in that house some point down the line, I can see that parking situation uh, in that neighborhood getting bad pretty quickly, assuming everyone had a car. The, uh, I'm, I'm sure it would, I'm sure it would um, mollify some of the concerns of, of neighbors. Um, but the question is, the question is, in this case, it, do we wish to reduce their ability that most other people have to have four individuals? I mean, most times we provide four unrelated individuals in a rental, unless there's reasons. So, I would leave that up to the board and to which they how they wish to think about that. Is there any, other people have comments from? Mr. Maxfield, comment? I would agree with this comment. Yeah, and, and just further, yeah. I want to go because it was uh, three bedrooms upstairs and downstairs. Yep. That's correct about that, right? Three bedrooms. Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, typically, I've, I've found um, often is the case if you're limited to one person, one bedroom. Uh, if you're not limited to that, you'll often see. Um, a quick look on on Facebook or something like that. Any uh, housing group posted people renting out a living room or something like that, or doubling up on a bedroom. This typically just increases rent prices without actually um, providing actually better housing. Where if you put that limit on it, there's still only so much someone will pay for a room. So it, it typically mm -hmm. keeps prices down as opposed to if you just let more people in, it ends up just being more. Uh, higher rent at the same price per person typically is what i've found so I, I support yeah limiting it to one person one bedroom in this case the ex existing tenants uh, they have four existing tenants now um when we went when we observed the the largest bedroom upstairs has two two beds and then you have uh, single beds in the other um two rooms so we currently have four people that they're renting that they're renting out currently upstairs and, and two downstairs. So I don't know if I want to take that away from the, the owners. Um, it's an existing condition, but I do understand the idea of having just two downstairs, and that seems to make sense. Ms. Parks. I was just going to add there's also a bathroom in the larger bedroom with two people. So there's two bathrooms on the upper floor. Yep. So I also think that it would be better to allow for in that dwelling. I've seen a lot of, we've been to a lot of places where I think your concern is really good, Mr. Maxfield, you know, where you just see really tiny rooms and they're doubling up and it just looks, it looks awful. This, this is a, these are large bedrooms and they, it, it looked like it could hold four people comfortably without being a, you know, a, a horrible situation or an unhealthy situation. Downstairs, there were a little bit smaller rooms. Um, and if the board wishes to reduce that number to two, which is the current usage, uh, we could do that through the conditions. 
Um, let's get from the board until we, and then we can come back to you, Mr. Rice, if there's something you need. Any other comments on that? Number four. All right, Mr. Rice, um, typically we don't get comments, but do you have a comment on number four? I, I just thought that a compromise could be at least one person per bedroom. You know, so in, in case the, the gentleman got married, he could be there with his child. There's three bedrooms, so at least three downstairs and then the four. So you'd be putting a limit on the number, you know, the, the, the number, but not at least it's pretty traditional to have at least one person for each bedroom downstairs, you know. Well, Rob, and Mr. Morrow, do we, if you have related adults, um, the, the zoning law bylaw doesn't preclude a married couple from from being in and their child from being in that um, uh, downstairs because they're related. Normally, we people are normally restricted for unrelated adults, and that's what that condition talks about. No more than four unrelated adults. So I'm not sure that that even if we say no more than two unrelated adults shall occupy the converted dwelling, which is downstairs, that would preclude a married couple from um, being there with their child. Is that right? Yeah, yes, that's that's correct. So we, you know, we define family a number a few different ways, and and what you're talking about is the number of unrelated individuals, not you know family, which can be made up a number of different ways as well. Uh, but in the example Mr. Rice mentioned that you know, that third person that came into the family would not be counted uh, to any limit. Uh, you know, none of them would be. They're, they're a family uh, as one. They're a family and, and not limited on the number of people. So then this limitation of, of condition number four, if we limited it to two people as um, was suggested, that would only apply to unrelated adults and, would, and it wouldn't apply to the current ownership. Um, as it, as a, as they are using it presently. But if they're no longer an owner occupant, they're not living there, then they'd be limited to be two uh, unrelated adults downstairs. Is that the wishes of the board? If that's the case, we'll move ahead. Okay, Maureen, let's have that be the condition then that it's two unrelated adults down. Mr. Mora, when you raise your hand, I get worried. <laughs> yeah, well, I just want to mention that, you know, th it's, it's creating a situation that we don't like to have happen. So we, we have a dwelling unit that has a lot of space, three bedrooms, and a condition that would only allow two occupants. Uh, it's just asking for a problem. So when we, when we deal with this situation through enforcement, and we're actually trying to lower the occupancy, um, we, we try to have the physical space match what the use is so you know just just to be aware of that it, it's not I'm not I, I wouldn't recommend that you have a limit of two three it, to match the number of bedrooms would make sense to me uh, and I think would be you know a good way to manage this size house uh, but totally up to you I just wanted to make you aware of it that it is something that we struggle with when there's larger spaces multiple bedrooms and having to tell them that they can't use them uh, because these individuals aren't on leases and it's really easy to have somebody come live there and, and fill that space that looks perfectly usable uh, other than what this condition says. Mr. Maxfield or Mr. Uh, Meadows, are you persuaded by that or would you like to, I think you, it looks to me like we had a, a majority of the board that was willing to do, that wanted to limit it to two. Um, were you persuaded by Mr. Mora's argument or not? And if you are, then we can go to three. If not, we'll, it looks like we have a majority of two. I mean, I, uh, I, I'll start with, um, yeah, I, I think what Ms. Mora says makes sense. I'm, I'm certainly much more in favor of uh, bringing down the number to match um, residents to, to bedrooms rather than lowering it uh, yeah, then, then having it less residents than there are available bedrooms. Um, so if we wanted to get to six, I'd rather do it by limiting the upstairs than limiting the downstairs. But if, if we don't think either way works, I'm, I'm fine keeping it four and three um, as well. 
Mr. Meadows, I know you had some thoughts on this as well. Well, my concern similarly was uh, in response to the abutters and the traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and on that basis, uh, you know, limiting it to one person per bedroom, um, upstairs and downstairs seems reasonable. So that would be three in the lower level and three in the upper level. Is that what you're proposing? But that wasn't that wasn't what was on the table. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. You added something that we, that was that was good, but that wasn't what was on the table. <laughs> I thought we had all right. What was on the table? I thought was we're going to go to a total of seven as opposed to a total of six. Um, we had four. They currently have four upstairs, and it's they're large, and there's one room that has two two beds, and it looks to be pretty big, and it looks to be like you could you you could easily have four people in that area downstairs. Um, there's three bedrooms. Right now, there's two people there. Um, and the question is, do we want to limit it to just two people? Do we want to limit downstairs? Because I, I do think it's unfair to the owners at this point to make them um, get rid of the upstairs tenants, even though we haven't seen that they've, they've had any problem with the current ownership, reduce the number of upstairs tenants. Well, then the, the original comment of, uh, of two for downstairs which is what they had in their application, sounds logical. I mean, the, the abutters are, are suggesting that the traffic yep. could be a problem. Yes. And I, I, I would like to um, help solve that problem for mm -hmm. the abutters. And I realize that it makes enforcement difficult, but not impossible. Because that's the intent right now of the of the owners. If it changes hands, we'll have a different owner come in front of us. It, it, yes, if it does change hands, we'll be able to review it and put additional con conditions on. That's correct. Ms. Parks or Ms. Co Mr. Cochran, do either of you have an opinion on this? Ms. Parks. I was just going to say, could, could you say six for the entire building? And that way, if it turned out to be one per bedroom, I don't know if that's too complicated because it's two units, but um, I'm fine with uh, four and two and four and three. I'm fine either way. I'm always okay. happy. I, I agree with uh, Mr. Maxfield's points about rental, uh, about rent cost. Yeah. Look, I think we, it sounds like we have a consensus around four and two for sure. Um, we may not have a majority of four and three. I'd like to, let's go with that. Um, but I'd, let's, I will take a, I'd like to have a vote to make sure that I'm reading the room correctly. So um, we, would we would amend condition four to say that uh, there would be no more than four people living in the upstairs and two people in the downstairs, two unrelated adults, unrelated adults upstairs and downstairs four and two. Um, all in favor of that, please say aye. Before you do that, oh, I think yep. Mr. Mora had raised his hand, perhaps. Oh, I, did, I missed it. Rob. OK, I was going to let it pass, but since, uh, since right. you called on me, I, you know, in response to Mr. Meadows' comments, I just wanted to throw out another suggestion because it actually is really difficult to enforce how the interior of these units are used. Uh, you know, we have to have a, a bit, we have to be provided access to the building. Uh, and it's not easy to get it without that uh, being given that permission. So if, if there's a concern about traffic, it is much easier and we have effective ways of enforcing what happens outside of the property, outside of the building. So irrespective of the number of residents or tenants in the building, you could limit the number of cars on site. Right, the number of parking yeah can be parked there regularly. Um, you know, we th I think based on what I understand, you know, the 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 lower unit at least for the the near future would only have one vehicle associated with that uh, parent and child uh, arrangement. Four cars for the upper level. You know, a condition of five or six cars 
there's certainly, we know there's uh, plenty of uh, interest in housing with or without cars associated with it. And that's something that could be uh, regulated and enforced by our department and, and, and solve it, or help support the 9.22 finding that you'll make to ensure that this doesn't uh, detrimentally affect the neighborhood. And the neighbors would be able to um, also monitor that more easily than they could uh, residents. They would monitor, they could monitor the number of cars and that are parking there. Any thoughts on that? I like that idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that makes, I think that that's somebody who's dealt with this for years came up with a really good idea <laughs> because I think that, I think that, um, balances out the concerns and the, the concerns of the owners and the concerns of the, of the neighbors, the abutters in a way that's fair to both. Um, all right, so let's, I would think that we should limit the cars to, um, to five. How does that go? That's, that seems to me to be fair. You've got four tarred spaces and one uh, improved space off to the side. Could I say? I would suggest yep. simply because if the the um, son living downstairs ends up with a partner, and that partner has a car, they they wouldn't be able to be there. So All right. I would so I would say six. Go to six. I'm fine with that. Others, anybody oppose that? Okay. So let's have six cars as a limitation, Maureen, as a condition. Um, going through additional conditions, it's gotta be registered with the rental property bylaws. Street numbers have to be included. Parking shall be on improved services only. Um, that's, you can put the limitation there. Mm -hmm. Property, they don't have a property or a, a landscape plan, but they, uh, but through the conditions, um, and they've asked for a waiver of having a landscape plan, but through conditions, I think we can achieve what we want, keep litter and debris, um, keep the property free of litter and debris, main, make sure that the grass is regularly maintained. Um, we have our standard, which we have started to use standard provisions for uh, when the differentiation between owner occupied and non-owner occupied for the number of people on the property. Um, in the event the property becomes non-owner occupied, the maximum number of people on the property at any time shall be, um, since we're gonna have six total people on the property, I would say 12, eight people, uh, six people and everybody can have a guest. Mm -hmm. All right. Change of ownership uh, shall be required to come back and submit a management plan. Uh, upon being non-owner occupied, they'd have to submit a management plan additional information for residential leases. Um, Got to go through a um, number of individuals. We, we could go back and look at the number of individuals and the number of overnight guests, as well as the parking management plan. But that's in the case that it becomes a non-owner occupied uh, property on change of ownership. Are there any other conditions that people wish to consider? Or are there any conditions that are listed that they do not wish to impose on the property? Okay, uh, then we have to make some findings uh, because this is a converted dwelling. There's a whole series of findings we have to make and we have to go through those. Um, and I would ask you to go through those considering making these findings, considering that we have these, these conditions that we put on the application. The first is, is it a converted dwelling? And um, as a project application report outlines, it is, um, it fits the de definition of a converted uh, one family detached dwelling built in 2000. The proposed converted dwelling will occupy the lower floor of the existing house. Therefore, it meets the definition of a converted dwelling. There are um, section 3.3241, which is the converted dwelling section, has eight specific standards that have to be met for a converted dwelling. Um, and when you go through those, we find that the existing residence occurs in a property uh, located uh, at 47 Valley Lane. And they're proposing to the standard one is that it's an existing residence and that it's located as it um, can be, it will be converted. It meets that. Standard two is that it may be involved in conversion of one or more structures. 
would and that would um, and a dwelling unit that exceedingly would would otherwise not be allowed under the table three, which is the the dimensional tables. Um, and this does this. This is the question. It does not meet the dimensional requirements. It is um, should be twenty six thousand feet for two units. It's only twenty two five. But we are under section eight of our standard eight of section three point three two four. We are given the the permission um, and the possible the authority to uh, provide a one-time exemption from the rules. It can't be done from this dimensional requirements. It can't be done again if we make a finding under 9.22, which is um, listed on page uh, six at, at the bottom of page six. The finding of nine point, if we make a finding under 9.22, we can have a one-time exemption to, we can permit a one-time exemption to the dimensional requirements. So that means that we, uh, generally what we have to do is find that the um, non-conforming use of the building, in this case, the, the, the dimensional side uh, of the lot, um, or non structurally that has been structurally altered or enlarged or reconstructed, which it hasn't been in this case, but provided that the authority finds that such alteration, enlargement, or reconstruction is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non-conforming use or non-conforming building. So we'd have to find that 9.22 means that what, allowing this conversion would not be more detrimental to the neighborhood than what it currently exists at the time. And it's currently and has been a, um, a number, a large, um, it's been a, a rental property before, um, and I don't think this makes it any worse is my view, um, but we'd have to make that finding. Is there any discussion about that from members of the board? Do we? Tammy, yes, just, Ms. Parks. Just a quick hmm. question. Did we count the Hadley property in the square footage that was part of the 22? thousand square feet. Maureen? I did. Um, I, I looked up the, um, the the recorded plan for this property. And so there is 19,191 square feet uh, in Amherst and there's 3,302 square feet uh, that crosses into Hadley. So that's a total of 22,493 square feet. And what what is that open field that's next to the house? What who's who owns that? Um that is a conservation property. I believe it's an agricultural field. Yep. All right. But it's not listed on any of the maps, uh, right? It's in Hadley. We don't have it on our map. But, but the town of Hadley and the abutters were uh, were notified of this public hearing. So the question really comes down to whether we want to um, provide a one-time exception to the um, dimensional requirements. When I look at this, I do see it's a pretty, it's wide open space. And while normally I wouldn't, um, wouldn't be as sympathetic to, um, you know, 3,000 or half of the additional space requirement isn't, is, is gone here, is not included. There's, there are 3,000, there's um, over 3,000 um, feet, square feet short. It's, it, there's a lot of open space, it's a large lot. And um, I, I don't think that the additional, um, that the conversion is going to change anything um, in terms of the uh, density of the housing and the density of the neighborhood. So I don't think it, I don't, I'm not concerned in this case about approving the one-time um, dimensional uh, waiver so that they can, can, can convert, have a converted dwelling. That's the real, I think that's the real issue here. I don't know if other people have a thought about that or not. When, in the site plan, when we in the site visit, it looks, it looks pretty wide open. I don't think that it's gonna be increased crowding in the neighborhood, obviously. There's no, no difference in the, um, the footprint of the, of the building and currently. All right, so we need to look at, we'll, so is there any, is there approval of a 9.22 waiver that 
this would not be detrimental to the neighborhood, more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing use if we allow the one-time uh, variation from the um, dimensional requirements of the converted dwelling of 26,000 feet allowing 24,300. Um, if there's no, I would entertain a motion. I'd like to get a vote on this. I'd entertain a motion for a vote to approve a 9.22 waiver. Um, do we have such a, a motion? So moved. And, and a second. I hear second. Mr. Maxwell for a second. Is there any discussion about that? I think it's important that we make that decision. All right, let's have a roll call vote. The chair votes aye to approve the 9.22 waiver. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Cochran? Aye. All right. So that means that we've met the requirements for um, in standard two and it comes back again in standard eight. Standard three is not applicable. Standard four um, is not proposing any, any exterior changes to the um, structure. I guess other than the, the windows perhaps in the door. Yeah. There should be no significant change except the special parameters may authorize modification such modification or alteration does not it doesn't substantially change the building character or its effect on the neighborhood. So I think we can find that that's that's true. Uh, standard five is not applicable to the project removal. Standard six uh, deals with um, where the where, deals with where converted dwellings can be located. In this case, um, one of the, the requirements would be located near a road or near the educational district and it's across the street from the educational district. Um, and one of the units shall be remain owner occupied, a requirement of which shall be made a condition of any, any special permit issued in such the instance. The University of Massachusetts is across the street uh, the educational zoning district um, is there, and if the application submitted, a family member of the trust will reside in the dwelling unit. So I think we can, can find that, we've, that we have we meet standard six. Standard seven, it's already connected to public sewer. Standard eight, the applicant has requested the board to modify the dimensional requirements. Uh, and we made the 9.22 finding, and I, I'm assuming that that vote is that there's nobody that objects to the dimensional finding that we made through the 9.22 finding. Standard nine is not applicable. Standard eight, uh, standard 10, they have submitted a management plan. They have not submitted a, a landscape plan, but there are conditions regarding lawn, there will be conditions now regarding parking and about upkeep. So I think we can waive the requirement for a, a landscape plan for a, for a property. And lastly, number 12 is converted dwelling. Uh, should provide a minimum of 2000 square feet of usable space. There's more than adequate usable space on that property. Parking access and regulations, there's requirement of two for space. We're gonna provide for six for the, um, so we meet, that's met. The dimensional requirements, we have the chart and now we have to, and if anybody objects to any of these findings, please speak up, but, cause I don't wanna have to have a vote on every single one except 9.22, which I think was key. Uh, 10.380 and 10.381, which suitably located in a neighborhood. Um, there are both single family and uh, a limited number of two family homes. The residential use already exists on the property. And according to the submittal of family member of the family trust will reside in this property will be owner occupied. 10.382, 383, 385 and 387 deals with nuisance, pollution, um, vibration, et cetera. Um, we have, the staff has meant suggested we consider exterior lighting. We have done that. Um, I don't think that there's any reason to believe that the noise are, um, and um, nuisance will will uh, engen endanger or uh, uh, bother the neighbors. Uh, we've limited the number of people that are there. We've limited the number of parties, and we can have a gatherings uh, pretty se severely. So I don't. Th I think we can meet the requirements of in ten point three eight two, three, five, and seven. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities provided for the preparation. Uh, we've got the utilities, so the proposed use is met. 10.386, um, the pro 
proposal ensures that it's conformance with the parking sign regulations. Um, the, we'll have to amend this moraine to the applicant provides six parking spaces in total. Um, the applicant is not proposing signage, but they do require they are required to have signage for the the house number and for each of the units. Correct? Yeah. Right. All right. We need that just for fire and safety. Um, I don't think, yeah, safe vehicular traffic within the site. Um, I think that's clear from the parking. Uh, off street loading isn't applicable. Um, disposal, they, the building already exists on the site, on the site, um, and trash is picked up, and the bins are. I remember the bins were off to the side and there's so the screen from the the neighborhood if they're kept off to the side and that's where they're on the drawings are they not yeah so they have, they'd be required to be kept off to the side um flood isn't not a flood zone and lastly um there's no unique historical property we've done 10.39 we've talked about the lighting storage bins and the vegetation 10.393 protects property. Um, we've, again, that deals with lighting and noise and trespass. We've dealt with that. 10.394, uh, steep slopes is not applicable. 10.395 does not create disharmony with respect to terrain and scale. Um, there's no changes and no scale changes. 10.396, um, screening. It isn't screened. Um, there's not a fence around it, but it's screened from the side of the house. Screens it from the. Will screen the um, trash and recycling bins from the neighbors. If it, and if they have to be done in the uh, place as, as outlined on the mat on the uh, site plan that we've seen. Recreational facilities are on the site, and the proposed is harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and of the master plan. It's a two residential unit. is in harmony with the master plan which encourages a greater mix of housing types to be found throughout the community. The board needs to determine where the proposal meets section 3.3211 and 10.38 of the bylaw. So I would move that we have made our findings required under the, um, I would entertain a motion that we make the findings required under the, um, under both converted dwelling section as well as 10.38 and that we impose the conditions that we have discussed. And with that finding and that condition, we approve the special permit application for this property. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Um, do we have any discussion about that motion? All right. If not, a vote occurs on the motion to approve the special application, the special permit application with conditions and that the findings required under that section are, are, are made. Um, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. <laughs> Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Cochran? Aye. Ms. Kath? <laughs> That's Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got six votes. All right, the motion passes. Um, that's um, agenda business. Next order of business is the um, general comments from the public. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Um, and you'll be working with the town and, and the owners will be working with the town to make sure they get the the, the lights are um, provided and that the parking is um, quali meets the requirements that are laid out uh, for the parking requirements under section seven, okay? All right. Um, this is a time when, when any member of the public can comment on anything not before the board tonight, on any matter not before the board tonight. Doesn't look like we have anybody, Maureen Dewey that wants to talk on from the public. So they not, should indicate by raising your hand. I don't, I don't see any hands raised. I don't see any hands. I don't, don't see any 
other participants. All right. Um, then the last thing is business to that occurred in the last 48 hours. Um, and you got an email from Maureen today concerning a uh, proposal before the town council. That proposal before the town council would be to have a moratorium on siting and um, uh, special permit applications for um, large solar arrays. And that um, right currently um, those come to the ZBA. In fact, we've dealt with four of them in the past. Um, they were complicated in that we didn't have very much in the way of guidance on how to deal with a large solar array, what considerations we should give. There's a lot of technical issues there. And it's just a lot of, quite frankly, subject that we don't have. Um, I was asked by the, subsequent to the introduction of that resolution, I was asked by the chair of the planning board who would, uh, who also, that board also would have a role in uh, citing uh, large solar arrays if they use a, a subdivision designation, uh, asked my opinion on whether there ought to be a moratorium or whether we ought to go ahead. My opinion, I wrote to the chair of uh, the planning board chair and said that I thought we'd be better served if there was some kind of a, a bylaw uh, for the, that, the, that we could use as a measure against which to, to judge these projects. Um, and I've submitted, and I, Maureen sent you a copy of that letter. Uh, the planning board does not feel that way. The planning board voted five to two uh, to not recommend a uh, moratorium. Subsequently, one of the town councilors wrote me and asked me um, if I thought it made sense to have, um, if the consultant would solve all of our problems. And I think I, I wrote back and as you, the um, letter that you have, I wrote back and I said, I don't think it solves all of our problems either. I think we're better off with a, a, a bylaw. Um, so that was my response to being asked as chairman of the ZBA, what, uh, what, my, what my opinion is, is the best way to go about this. Um, this is something that I think the town is gonna have to deal with over the next couple of, of weeks. Um, this has come up rather quickly in the most recent iteration of the, of the, the moratorium. And I just wanted to make sure you knew what I was, how I was responding to these questions from um, from town councils and from other from other uh, town boards, the chairman of other town boards. Um, I didn't say that's the opinion of the ZBA. I didn't say that was a, we'd had a vote on it. I was asked as, in my position what I thought and I, and I told them what I thought. So you should take a look at that. And I wanna encourage you if you want, if you have a different view or belief, the town council is, is gonna deal with this as soon. There's no, no sooner or no, as soon as Monday, I don't know if that's be the final um, time when they deal with it, but there is a meeting on Monday and it will at least be discussed on Monday, but I, I suspect this will go on for a while. Um, if you wish to, to have an opinion, you can express it to them at any time. Uh, and we can certainly, I think we can certainly um, have a meeting where we explain all the, in case we, there isn't a moratorium and we do have LSAs that we have to deal with, we should probably have a meeting on our, of our members where we go through and get educated about um, some of the considerations that need to be made when we consider um, solar arrays. It's, there are lots of complications and um, I know some people have more knowledge about this than, than I do on this board and we can use their help. And I think, um, and that's basically what happened in that conversation, in that correspondence. I just wanted to make you aware of it. I'm glad to take some questions now or talk about it, but I think it's probably, um, something that we should probably spend some time on later on. Mr. Meadows. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think this is not a short discussion at all. Yep. Um, even some of the factors that were brought up about a consultant and what they could do, that's not one consultant. One person can't right. answer all of the questions that are entailed there. And if, if those questions are part of any bylaw, they've got to be solved by a whole variety of consultants. And I don't know that we have the capacity to bring all those people in. Yeah. So it, it is a lengthy discussion. It is a lengthy discussion. Um, anyway, I would encourage you, go ahead, Ms. Parks. I was just going to say, I, I would like to learn more about it because I, I don't know all the nuances of uh, the pros and cons of the large solar arrays. 
you know what I, I generally what I think is a good thing to do. Um, my bias is I think solar power is great. I think we ought to have more of it, and I think that we ought to be thinking about where we place it, where we cite it. Those are important considerations. Um, and I think what's really important is that we have guidance that there is a that there is a consensus in town about where is the right place to put solar um, large solar arrays, and that we have the right kind of dimension. That there's there's town gives guidance to us because we're not. I think Mr. Meadows has more knowledge about this than I do, but we're not solar experts. And the benefit of this would be to have the town say, these are the values that we have. This is what, this is what we wanna, this is how we wanna cite these solar arrays. And these are the considerations that the board should make when it's making decisions as whether to do that or not, and whether they meet those, those factors that the town has decided are important to them. So Tammy, what I would suggest, what I found helpful is to take a look at, um, the planning board's meeting of January or of February 15th, there was a, a um, and I'm not gonna suggest that you spend three hours listening to another <laughs> town board. I did, but I'm not gonna ask you to do that. Um, we all have lives to live, but to read the um, proposal, the, the um, handout that Chris Breshtrup and the staff make, gave to the board, it goes through some of the discussion, the discussion of some of the, uh, the factors that ought to be thought about, about the, what other towns have done. It's a good first step and it gets you going on some of the issues that we are, undoubtedly will have to deal with in the future, but that's a good first step. So it's the planning board material distributed to the planning board and the, the February 16th, I think, 16th meeting. And if we wanna talk about it, let me or Maureen know and we'll schedule some time to talk about it uh, in the near future. All right. Just wanna make sure you know what your chairman is doing, even if he's not doing it in your name, he's doing it on his own. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else that anybody wants to bring up? Maureen, do we have a meeting scheduled? Uh, um, do we have items scheduled for the next meeting? When would, uh, so, Hmm. I am. A, we just uh, the ZBA just uh, received an application for a uh, townhouse development on at the corner of Fairing and Sunset Avenue. Um, it hasn't been filed with the town clerk yet. Um, so that's um, I would say expect that that if it if the application is complete and can be filed with the town clerk. Uh, I believe the next meeting would be scheduled for March 24th. Wait, time out. Let me just make sure. Is that the one, two, three, four? Yeah, March 24th. And I believe we don't have any items scheduled um, uh, for earlier dates. So, um, but I can clarify that uh, tomorrow or early next week. But I believe uh, so. Uh, the full members. Oh, and, and it looks like, yeah, John Gilbert um, was unable to attend. He's a full member. Um, I can reach out to him. So um, full members should expect to attend the March 24th meeting. March 24th. And, and I probably will not be able to attend the, the 10th meeting. So if there's something does, does come up, we'll have to have a um, another chair. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Maureen. I forgot to introduce both of you at the beginning of the... Uh, I looked for many of these friends, so I'm with you. I'm happy to introduce you to the public, and I should have done that. But thanks again for all your work. And to my fellow board members, thank you for your time. I appreciate it, and you're doing a service to the town. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see you all in a month. See you. All right. Most have a great night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Maybe in person. Maybe in person. Mo uh, motion adjourn? Motion. Yeah, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, Mr. Is there a second? Second. Uh, this we got. This has got to be a roll call. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Chair votes aye. Tammy. Aye. <laughs> Dylan. Aye. Craig. Aye. Eric. Aye. All right. Thank you very much, all. Talk night, to you soon. Everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Let us know.